Hello everyone and welcome to this episode, the coaching one of the Women Talking About Learning podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Jacobs. Coaching is a word thrown about a lot in learning and development and it's one of those topics which people like to be able to speak about with authority. So, to make sure we make this episode authoritative, we've two top class speakers to talk about coaching. Our first guest is Donna Ward Higgs. Donna, as you'll hear, is highly energetic and enthusiastic. She's an established coach, mentor, facilitator and passionate learning specialist and is the director of Learning Partners Solutions Limited. Our second guest is Sue Merkin. Sue has worked in coaching and learning for almost 20 years and she is the CIPD's Learning Delivery and Associate Manager. In this role, she manages over 100 global associates who deliver CIPD courses and the teams that operationalise learning into CIPD's business-to-business and business-to-customer markets. This episode was recorded in March 2023, and there's talk of snow. At least in the UK, spring seems to be here now. Settle back for a brilliant conversation. This is Women Talking About Learning. This is Donna and Sue talking about coaching. Hello, Donna. How are you doing? You all right? Yeah, I'm good, Sue. Are you? Um, yeah, it's snowing here. So literally just started. So that just shows you how cold it is down in the south. Ah, it's cold here, but we've got sun and I am so happy to see the sun. <laughs> we've gone spring. Well, <laughs> I'm really happy to be talking with you today. And you and I both know we can talk, right? Um, yes. But we're, <laughs> but we're here to talk about coaching. And do you know what I'm wondering is, is that still a conversation? Is it still relevant to be talking about coaching? What do you think? Absolutely, you know, <laughs> a shadow of a doubt. And you expected nothing else from me in terms of that response. So it's um, I, it's still a buzzword, isn't it? And and I have I have some some feelings about that that buzzword and where it sits. Um, this this whole thing of um, coaching skills, which I think are something that anybody can and should develop versus the profession of coaching and I do think they're two distinctly yeah. different things don't you sir yeah no totally and I, th- I think for me um and and you're right I, you you're right when you say it's a buzzword but I actually think it's become a little bit of a cliche as well mm-hmm. so you know people um, that have got coach in their job title when really it's 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 a management it's a management position um, and also I think that definition between taking a coach approach to something and being a coach I still think that that gets confused yes and then you throw into the mix mentoring and information advice and guidance and teaching and training and learning and there's a there's a beautiful melting pot where those things can come together Uh, but in order to do that effectively you have to be really clear about what the individual components are and coaching is different it's its own specialism yeah, I agree. And I think that and it's going to be very difficult for us to disagree on this conversation. I'm going to try and find something because I know you and I are quite aligned to 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 a lot of, of, of the topics around coaching. So I'm going to throw something in, in right, right here, right now into the conversation. Go so for it. You made that distinction between, look, coaching skills and it can be coaching skills that someone can use as a manager, as a parent, as a teacher. So that's that. And then we've got the coaching profession when people are um, making a living out of being a coach. So where are you sitting that there has to be a real regulation wrapped around you know that's my stance I very much believe in supervision I believe that the the hours should be put in but talk me through when you make that real critical distinction what are you expecting from that professional coach so I, I think just picking up on a couple of the things you said there so so the the training to start with. Mm -hmm. So really having invested the time and the effort in the learning part, the theory, the models, the mechanics, uh, so that you've got that structure, that skeleton from which to build and adapt your practice. I think 
I think the rise of professional bodies, I think the um, the move towards things like um, the global code of ethics, codes of conduct, um, having things in place where your CPD hours, your supervision, uh, your actual practice hours are um, recorded and interrogated. I think that's important. I, I don't think showing up for a, a two hour online course that you paid £17 on a voucher for cuts it for, for calling yourself a professional coach. I think things like um, accreditation, I think things like um, regulating and professionalising the industry can only be a good move for people wanting to engage with a coach. I think when you pay for a service, you should be able to benchmark what that service looks like, feels like, will give you what the person on the, the other side of that service um, has done to hold that title. Yeah, Donna, I, I agree. And I guess we're going to go a little bit full circle here because the word coach has suddenly become so, um, oh, I'm not sure if I can use the word bastardized, but you know what I mean. Um, so, so basically, it's become so all and everything, you know, oh, this person's a coach, this, this, this person's got coach in their title, we've suddenly called something coaching when it's mentoring. How do we get around that? Yeah, I see it a lot and have done for, for some time the word coach used in job title because that's that's the buzzword to be talked about. Everybody's a, a coach now and they're not. And so often, I, I mean, when I worked in the, the charity sector, I held the, the word coach in my job title before I'd actually undertaken any formal training in the methodology um, and, and the role itself was a blend of coaching, mentoring, information, advice and guidance. Um, so so I, th I think there's two sides to it, isn't there? There's, um, there's the, the level of professionalism in that particular specialism, but also is, is, it, rec is it too defined? Is it recognising the other skills that come into the, the job that's being done? I don't know that I have the answer, Sue, and, and I'm keen to hear what you think the answer might be. Um, but I, I think bandying the word coach around does as much harm as it does good. Yeah, I, th I think the problem could be is that there are numerous standards and bodies that are out there and who's right. So um, I'm going to sit on the fence and say, you know, is ILM better than OCM? Um, is um, ICF the, 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 the gold standard that everyone should, should go for or not? So there's it, it's problematic because who and what accreditations do you look for, um, you know, when, when you're trying to engage with a coach? So I think that that is problematic. I would also say that it's a bit like all the best chefs in the world. You have to have the basic training to understand how to bake a cake before you can start tweaking um, the recipe. Because it's only when you understand the foundation of what that coaching session should um, have a framework look like um, for you to be able to then be more intuitive around it. And and I know one of the things that I was pondering on before we had this conversation was if somebody asked me about my coaching style, it would be intuitive, but it certainly wasn't intuitive 10, 15 years ago. It was really prescriptive. Um, and what would I say to somebody? I would say, really learn the recipe before you put it aside and we bring in potentially a little bit more of your own style. So confession, Donna, I don't always stick to a model. I really, and in, in fact, I'm going back on myself, I don't stick to a model. I always have that model in the back of my mind. I know where we're going to get to at the end, but it's really helped my listening skills because I'm not hung up on where I am in a model or how sort of much synergy does that model have with the coachee. Absolutely. Yeah, the models are, are useful up to a point, aren't they? And, and I think this is where I'm really pleased to see coaching skills using a coaching approach becoming so much part of management and leadership dialogue, because it is those bedrock skills of listening and questioning and, and truly appreciating the person that's in front of you. But I think when we I think when we 
use that 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 title of of coach as a profession um it's about us understanding what that hangs on that process is always in our back pocket and actually that's the bit we hold on to not where the conversation goes not what the outcome of the conversation might be but actually the the safe container the the right conditions for that person that we're with to to feel able to do their thinking out loud um, and for that to be a productive use of their time effort and energy that it that for them it's going to generate that that new direction of thinking that new perspective that commitment to action whatever it might be it's it's how we hold that space and create those conditions for that to happen for somebody and and there's some magic in that isn't there there's total magic in it and while you were talking I could feel your passion about that accountability <laughs> and, and 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 that nailing the responsibility but also the next steps it led me to think of two things could there ever be um an AI coach oh there's a lot of debate about the the place I AI has um and rightly so I, I it's hard isn't it because we've with so much, I tend to see that there are two sides to a coin. Mm. So um, on the one hand, there's a lot of positive technological developments are opening up new horizons daily. By the minute, uh, new opportunities are opening up because of the, the growth of technology. But what do we lose on that? The more reliant we become on machinery, the more that's able to replace or replicate what we do as humans will it will it ever create the same level of connection will it ever be intuitive and curious enough to be able to ask that question that suddenly actually opens up the unconscious thinking process that might happen a day later or you know waking you up in the middle of the night because all of a sudden you're like oh wow so and also it, what does it mean for those parallel processes because so much of what we bring to the conversation as a coach is our own learning and curiosity oh you you said that but your face did this what what's going on there and 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 no attachment to what comes from that but the in the moment instinctive intuitive reactions responses will it will it be as attuned to that as a a human is a human who needs and wants connection at their very core i, th I think the power of coaching if I had to distill it down to a sentence, is that you create a safe space and you hold that space. And the fact that someone is listening and that someone is giving you time to process your thoughts and to, you know, summarize back to you what you might have said, which might have just skipped over, you know, your own head. That is the power could could artificial intelligence do that i i don't know but i will absolutely um you know I'll, i will watch with um curiosity and, and fascination really there's something else you said and i think this could be our disagreeing point du, 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 oh, donna come on let's have it so let's <laughs> so, have it so i know that coaching programs and you know my background so coaching programs are generally pitched at leadership and management training program level um i really disagree with that because i'm a really big believer in leading upwards and therefore having all that coaching skill at leadership and management level i really believe that coaching skills in the workplace isn't just about leaders and managers so what what do you think about that I don't know if this is going to disappoint you, but I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> I thought there we were going to disagree. Two, there are two people involved in a coaching conversation. And so the better equipped every individual is in, in showing up in that space, in being uh, willing to get curious, to be inquisitive, to be questioned, 
to to be a knower, uh, to let go of being a knower and mm. actually embrace being a learner. I, I think that's that's where some beautiful stuff really happens in organisations. So when you equip everybody with those skills of showing up to collaborate in a conversation, to be able to hold space for each other, to be able to um, ask a question that they don't know the answer to, and that be okay, you're going to get far better results culturally from that. Yeah, Donna, and I'm, I'm kind of talking a little bit on the top of my head here, but you've just said something that I'm now trying to put, put in a sentence. It's almost like... Um, that when you give that coach title, and I'm coming full circle about having coach in your job title when you might just be, a, you know, the manager, it almost still says that coaching at that level means at some level you might know more than the people underneath you, which is obviously, um, you know, the people working at grassroots level are always going to know more. You know, <laughs> I, I, I work in an ops role and, you know, for me, what my coordinators and execs know far exceeds whatever I would know because they're, they're doing the job. Does that, did I make yeah. sense of what I was trying to say just then? It, well, it, it struck a couple of different chords for me, to be honest. So, so one, it took me back to thinking about that distinction between coaching and mentoring mm. and how actually sometimes coaching is most powerful when you are completely separate to the environment. Mm. The yeah, no, I agree with that. Because it's you, you can't unknow what you know. And and it's 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 a great uh, it's a great idea, isn't it? To go well, I'm just going to park my knowledge and my experience and my expertise, but it's there. Like you've got it, you've amassed it. It's not going anywhere. So it's it it adds colour to the lens through which we see the world, and means that it's much harder to separate out whether you're coaching and whether you're mentoring. And again, coming coming back to this debate of a coaching approach and a coaching professional uh, I think a professional knows to recognize which hat they're wearing at which time and when it's moved when it's changed I guess that then leaches into where I think this sits as a conversation at management and leadership level because I think it's about um, that self-awareness knowing who you are, how you show up, the impact you have on others, but also having a, a real solid grasp on the different tools that are within your toolkit so that you're able to pick the right tool at the right time in the right circumstance so that the person in front of you gets their best result so that everybody's in a win-win yeah. situation. So I guess that's where, where, why I think it, it ends up sitting at that management and leadership level. But if your team aren't open to being coached, if they don't understand the, they don't, they're, if they're not given the chance to hone those crucial skills of questioning and listening, there's still something missing from the, from the, the equation, isn't that? Well, you can't coach someone that doesn't want to be coached, and. No. Um, I know that you and I previously have had a conversation about team coaching and saying that, you know, we, we I know both of us, Donna, are really big fans of action learning sets. Yes. But on that team coaching side about, you know, you can have a session where, you know, you're, you're contracting everyone, you're, you're going for the collaboration of that collective goal that they're working towards. You know, you, you can align the values of an organisation or the values of that team. But actually, with that team coaching aspect, what about the quiet voices? So is it, you know, it, you know, is it um, an opportunity for people to, in a team session, still remain quiet? Or does actually team coaching in, enable, um, you know, everyone to have that that voice because if you don't want to be coached and let's face it not everyone does um I've had conversations with my husband who will often say to me don't coach me don't, you're coaching me aren't you <laughs> and I was like no I'm just asking you loads of questions um but you know if somebody doesn't want to be coached in a team coaching session rather than an action learning se session ca can they can they I don't know check out don't know what's your thoughts well, it's, uh, I mean, it throws up a really interesting question about the team dynamics, doesn't it? And mm. uh, what the what the coaching's been brought in for, what it's uh, intended to influence or impact. 
project. But that those moments where you've got that person who's resistant to take part, that person who sits quietly and observes, all of that, all of that's the what we're working with when we're coaching. So, so I think I come back to what you said really early on in this conversation about that that principle of curiosity. When when we're when we're coaching. That's the prevailing driver, isn't it? That curiosity about what's going on in the moment for the person or people that are involved. And, and I think sometimes our job is quite simply holding up that mirror to go, I'm noticing this. What do you reckon? And mm. just seeing where that takes the room, the person, the, the group, the it, it is, it's that. It's that curiosity. Yeah, and I think that the, for me, and again, this is about facilitating. So for me, if, with a group, it's facilitating. Um, for, and this, this is my personal opinion. For me, that coaching on a, on a really deep, meaningful level, for me, it's always been one-to-one. So action learning sets, I always go through groups, but, but, and all facilitation. Um, and I guess that there's a real, I, I, I wonder if there's a trend there where some people would prefer team coaching. M- myself personally would be, a, um, a, I much prefer one-to-one work, which is what took me to coaching in, in the very, very first instance. Um, I took my, um, so team coaching has been on the rise more recently. Um, and I undertook some training around it at the end of of last year I think it's really exciting but the the thing for me to remember in all of it is any team is made up of individuals yeah 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 oh yeah lovely remember that on that one um so a question that I know we pondered earlier and we haven't yet stumbled on it I don't know if we're skirting around it um (laughs) is coaching a gender issue Shall I put my two pennies worth in first? Go for it. Because it's, yeah, bring us down, give us some parameters, because that question is massive. You could take that from a number of different angles, couldn't we? So I wholeheartedly disagree that there is uh, a gender issue in coaching. Um, I, I think that there's myth that women can probably listen better. I think there's a myth that women might be a little bit more curious and ask those questions. But I've had some fantastic coaching um, that has been orchestrated by men. Um, I've had space held um, for me to really explore um, the purpose of what I wanted to do with my goal that was was held by a man. So, so personally for me, I don't see any gender issues in coaching. No, for a, a similar, my experience, I, I've worked with male and female coaches and coaches. My current supervisor uh, is a man and holds space wonderfully, challenges me in a, in a, it's a, it's the relationship, isn't it? It's the rapport and the relationship that you create. But where, where I am curious about this, whether coaching is a gender issue, and I don't necessarily have an answer. In true coach fashion, I have more questions than I do answers on this. But around this idea of um, imposter syndrome, mm. I wonder if actually the, the rise of coaching is helping women to to start to level the playing field in owning their own success. Talk to me a little bit more about that. So, and, and I, I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm playing with it and thinking out loud as I'm talking. I don't know that I'm, I'm set with a, a foot strongly on, on a particular opinion, but the this narrative of imposter syndrome has, has been around for ages, hasn't it? Lacking self-confidence, yeah. lacking that self-belief, walking into a room and feeling like everybody else is more qualified, more knowledgeable, more uh, more, more everything than you. And it, it, it does tend to be an issue identified more by women than men, given quite often the, the patriarchal, structures that exist within organizations i wonder if the the rise of coaching is actually 
in part about leveling that playing field, having um, having somebody trusted in your corner that helps you to develop that level of belief in yourself, mm, that level mm. of self-assurance that what you bring to the party has value. Yeah, I, I hear where you're coming from. I'm not sure, and I've got no evidence, and I wish I had, but I, I, I haven't. Um, I'm going to have to rely on someone to get this for me. Um, I don't have any evidence to suggest that imposter syndrome is more of a female issue than a male. So I would know certainly from working with, as you know, I used to work with young people with learning disabilities, and I would say it's as much an issue with young men, and I'm going to use the word young, um, than it was with the young women that I worked with because I was working with young people. So I can only, mm. I can only mirror it across to that. But being able to hold a mirror up to someone on all the things they do well and hold um, a mirror up to actually not everyone is brilliant at all things um, and really supporting someone's self-belief and actually smashing their limiting beliefs absolutely I can I can see why that would help level a playing field for people that did have imposter syndrome let's face it we all have an element of it or is that just me for sure it's human it's, it's to <laughs> oh, be God for human that. it's to be human and that's that's where I think it's it's a really interesting lens to look at things through whether gender plays a part I, I tend to always come back to the the, the commonality of our humanness. Yeah. I, I don't think it's that easily defined, is it? No, I, I, it's not a gender issue, I don't think. It's a human issue. It's a personality issue. You know, in, you know, some people make wonderful coaches. Other people would rather tell rather than ask. I think it boils down to that simplicity, do you? Oh, so now you, you've triggered something in me there, Sue, <laughs> with that final statement. I, I I think everybody is capable of learning and developing the skills. To if be they want able to. to use yeah. a if they approach. want to. Yes. Um, yes, there might be uh, tendencies, preferences that make that more natural for some than others. But I think anybody can learn. Anybody can make that choice to invest the time, effort and energy in developing those skills. Um, I, I had somebody say to me once, some people just shouldn't, they just can't coach and they shouldn't. I, I think when we write anybody off like that, like just some people shouldn't, that there's something to, that always makes my spidey sense prick up with a little bit of a... <laughs> Are we sure about that? Like, that sounds like such an absolute. And I, and I wonder, actually, is here some of the, some of what's a common thread for coaches? We play in that grey space, don't we? Yeah. Uh, but I also think that there's two things here. Um, if someone truly wants to be a coach, they can learn to be a coach. Yes. I think it comes back to your original statement as anyone can learn great coaching skills and anyone if they have the passion and desire and want to be a coach can learn to be a coach but you can have great coaching skills without being a coach yes absolutely and they'll serve you well in life yeah because that magic that you talked about earlier and that playing in the gray space that let's go to where you know we wouldn't ordinarily go to our black and our white our known and you know we, we, we stay in our comfort zone just being stretched by those questions the person that's holding that magic wand and enabling that has that real understanding of people has that real desire to want to hold that space for the person they're working with yes it, it, it takes energy and effort I know that at the end of a at the end of a day um coaching at the end of a coaching session it's really important to just go and take some space because it's it's exhausting to to 
to hold that space for somebody and be completely in the moment with them in whatever direction they choose to go uh, and to to have that to keep on top of that curiosity takes energy and effort it, you can't just turn up and dial it in there are some jobs aren't there that you can you can just kind of show up and, and give it a a 50 percent day Ah, that's all good. You know, I've, I've done the basics. I've done what needs doing. I, I, I think that's really hard to do coaching well if, 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 if you're turning the dial in that way. Because it's not, it's, not, um, it's not a hard and fast rule book. Human beings don't come with a user manual. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're so unique. Um, I mean, the, the, uh, there are so many common threads, but but the way our own individual DNA is mixed up, our own unique blend and take on the world, you you can think if as a coach, I, and I say this quite a lot when I do training, it, the day I wake up and think I'm an expert and I've got this stuff nailed is the day I need to give up. <laughs> because when you lose that that spark of curiosity, that willingness to learn, I think I think you lose some of the magic of what coaching's about. And the whole reason there's not a manual for human beings is because there's no two human beings alike. And no. so always understanding that uniqueness, always, you know, understanding that everyone is going to look at things through a totally different lens and perspective. Um, and even, you know, understand things differently in a completely different way um, I don't think it's necessarily understanding because that feels huge that feels like a lifetime's work in itself I think actually it's appreciating mm. I think that appreciation is is where we show with a desire to understand but I think it's that I, I don't think we always have that understanding I don't think we can possibly know to that depth of understanding the nuances of every individual. So I think it's just that appreciation, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, acknowledging. You mentioned earlier about imposter syndrome and um, potentially that, that, that being a women's issue. I mean, what advice would you give to women who want to be coached or, 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 or want to be a coach? Hmm. I think everybody should experience coaching. I think there's nothing quite like it. What it opens up in, in, a, in a really short space of time, what it can open up in your thinking is, is quite mind blowing. And so I, I, I think in terms of being coached, I think a willingness to have that experience and openness um, is important. I think in terms of wanting to coach, it's a stepped process, isn't it? So I, I, I guess first and foremost, it comes back to wanting to invest in those oversimplified skills of listening and questioning. We take for granted that we listen, don't we? We take for granted that we can ask questions, but doing that well is a skill. And I, I, I guess that's a starting point, really kind of honing those skills and seeing seeing how you feel about doing that does it make you want to do it more to have you got that that zest and that energy to really want to play in that space or actually does it feel like a lot of effort and you can turn it on but you're also really glad to turn it off maybe maybe that's kind of a kind of a, an indicator between that space of using a coaching approach and stepping into being a coach. I don't know. What would you add to that, Sue? I'm keen to hear your thoughts. I'm going to echo your words back to you, Donna. <laughs> I tell, I, I tell, first of all, I'd say the advice would be just put that imposter syndrome aside. Um, so any, oh, I'm not a good listener. Or, I was told when I was 12, I wasn't a good listener or I'm never going to have the right questions. Um, what would I answer? You know, what would I ask next? Oh, I just don't know. Just put all that noise aside. Um, the other advice I would give was actually really research where you can go to um, get training 
Um, look at testimonials of what people have said. I'd say don't always go to the biggest, most well-known places, um, yeah. but really, really research it thoroughly. Um, and what feels right so be a little bit of intuitive of where you go but make sure that it's with um, an accreditation that holds value um, in, in that business community. Uh, yes and I think the other indicator I'd look for with training is um, lots of supported practice hours. Coaching is an experiential yeah. skill and I know you liken it to learning to drive. The, the idea <laughs> yes, that, you know, that there is a manual but that will only take you so far you've actually got to get in and give it a go to, to work out how it works. So uh, I never anything that tells you you can just read this this book or write this assignment and you're good to go isn't isn't getting into the crux of, of what coaching's about. And 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 that would link me back to looking for a coach. I think there's something in making sure that person has testimonials but also have conversations when when you're looking to engage with a coach uh, talk to talk to three or four and see how that feels see what the relationship is like from the offset because it's so much is is in that relationship and that rapport I would say that um, there's so many networks as well isn't it um, to find those coach, coaching so circles um, that so certainly locally, if you can research what coaching circles um, around uh, your local area, that there's there's a wealth of uh, information there. I, I used to belong to one where I used to live and it was just fantastic to be in the presence of a group of fantastic coaches and just sharing good practice and um, just supporting each other was, was for me really, really important. I'm a yeah, really big fan. The, oh, sorry, Donna, just to finish. I'm, I'm a really big fan of self-directed and online learning. But I actually would say if you are wanting training to be a coach, that is the one thing where you need people around to support that training practice because it's about those coaching hours. And I think modules on coaching that are online and self-directed are really worthwhile, you know, to, to have that knowledge bites around coaching online. Fantastic. Nothing wrong with that. But to actually get a certification in coaching, to do it purely online, me personally, I would feel I need to go somewhere where there are supervised coaching hours and you get feedback. You get feedback on your performance while you're training. I don't know, Donna, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, so I know, uh, I mean, COVID taught us a lot about things that can be facilitated online. Um, and I know with things like ICF, you can submit video recordings for review and assessment. So there are ways, there are ways and means. I, I think, I think I would agree that you need a, a well-rounded range. I don't think it's either or. I think you should experience it in as many formats as you can. So a, a lot of our coaching, we've talked about this, we do a lot of our stuff via online platforms. So just to be really clear, I was talking about self-directed, so that complete self-directed on, on your own piece rather than, because I think online, online coaching uh, and being able to talk on an online platform live is, is, is fantastic. In fact, I do all my coaching via Teams and Zooms. So, uh, oh, Donna, we could just be chatting about this all day couldn't we really this should this should be like the Donna and Sue coaching day conversation <laughs> yeah, do, do, do we label this part one with, with part two to follow at, at, at another point we're gonna have to give Andrew a nudge to give us some more airtime so we can finish this conversation mm. off I was gonna add one other point about um networks and that is you can join um any of the three professional bodies without formal qualification um, and a lot of them I know with EMCC European Mentoring and Coaching Council you can access um, the regional networks and special interest groups as a, a, a non-member so if you're if you're wanting to kind of find out more have a bit of a listen in engage with like-minded souls um, professional bodies are actually a really nice place to start um, as well as as well as local networks well Donna I think our time's up before Andrew kicks us off. Um, it's gone so fast. <laughs> it really has. <laughs> um, 
It's lovely to chat with you. Have a fantastic holiday because I know you're about to go somewhere. And um, I'll see you on the next one, eh? Yes, yes. I really look forward to touching base with you again. So uh, have enjoy the rest of your day. I will. Right, take care. Ta-ra! Bye. We normally target 35 minutes or so for an episode, and this one went on a little longer, but could probably easily have gone on longer still. We are working out if we need to record a follow-up episode, so please do let us know, so that's Donna, Sue and ourselves, if you'd want to hear more. There are elements in this conversation which will require re-listening, and Donna and Sue found many lenses to look at coaching which we hadn't expected to hear. Our massive thanks to them for their time in recording this episode and giving us such rich content. There are a ton of links in the show notes for the episode, along with the contact details for Donna and Sue. Someone mentioned to me the other day about making women talking about learning a Patreon or subscription model. This will never happen. It's important to us that women talking about learning will always be free at the point of entry. Similarly, we won't accept sponsorship for women talking about learning since it might be perceived to compromise our editorial approach. However, you can send us a couple of pounds or dollars if you want, just to get a cuppa. The details are in the show notes and on our website. We're still recording. We have a few episodes that are being planned for now and we have a few that are being produced and ready to be published over the next few weeks. Details of future topics and how to be a guest are also on our website. Next time, it's the Changing Careers one. As always, thanks for listening, and we'll see you again soon.